We're standing here in a forest in the Mgani catchment. Now, a forest like this is actually quite unusual in many respects. The, the topography here lends itself to open grasslands, which is most of what the Mgani catchment is. The Mgani arises out of a number of sponge areas, and it's been recorded as the Mgani sponge, or the greater Umgani sponge, and within that are independent flays, and the best known one is the Umgani flay, which is a protected area, but what people don't realize is that there are other ones along this escarpment, and we're standing in the valley of the Purth stream, and that has its own source at a flay up at Impantle, at a village called Kwanovoka. There's 162 hectares of very pristine wetland there. The stream bubbles out of there, goes through a narrow gap in the rocks up on the escarpment. In Afrikaans, that's called a port, and it could be argued that that's where it got its name from. It then goes through a farming area where there's commercially farmed beef and seed potatoes. Then it cascades over a waterfall and comes into the ravine that we find ourselves in now. In that steep ravine is, of course, this forest. These forests tend to cling to the south and southeast facing slopes within steeper ravine. It flows through this and it comes out at the bottom and joins the Umgani. And where it joins, if one stands at the confluence and looks at this stream, it's arguably bigger than the Umgani. So hence a lot of disagreement as to where is the true source of the Umgani River. This is a wattle tree, Acacia mernsii, which is native to Australia and it's commonly regarded as a problem tree in South Africa. It does very well in these conditions. Our rainfall here is about 950 mils per annum and these wattles just love that. They sap a huge amount of water. And one of the problems is that being an evergreen they sap water right throughout the year. The other thing is that they are generally, if you get a number of them together, they've got this allelopathic effect where nothing else grows. You don't see that here because we've got quite good understory under the forest, but certainly if you get a group of these, you start to see bare ground and then you see erosion. So they, they really are problematic and they, they infest everywhere. So there are a lot of people involved in trying to push back with the species. Now, this particular one has found its way into the forest and there's a lot of debate about what to do about this. If you came and cut this down, you would immediately, it would drop on some of the indigenous trees and destroy them. Um, the other thing, it, in your cutting and dragging and what have you, you would disturb the soil. Now, nothing likes disturbed soil more than an invasive species. So as soon as you've done that, you'll get more small wattles, probably some bugweed, some bramble, those types of species, maybe a pine tree or a gum. And so you, in a way, you've exacerbated the problem w without that having been your intention. So there's a new school of thought is that one should use these as a canopy species of the forest, as though it were indigenous, and foster the well-being of some small sample trees underneath here, typically a yellowwood tree, but it might be a Cape Holly or a bladder nut or a Cape Chestnut or one of those um, canopy species. Get that going, plant it if you need to, or just identify one in the surrounding. Once you've got that fairly strong, and it won't grow very high because it's in the shade, but once you've got that strong and established, is to then come and ring bark these trees, perhaps with a little bit of herbicide so that it doesn't coppice. And the tree will stay standing certainly for quite a while. It won't necessarily fall immediately and damage other trees. As its foliage starts to die off, it will leave a, a hole in the forest uh, canopy and the small species that you've planted or identified will then capitalize on that opportunity and it will fill that hole and become a canopy species. And with a good canopy and a good understory, the chances of these alien invader species getting in is much diminished. So we're not in a rush to come and cut these down. We want to come and make sure that there is a, a species ready to take over from this tree and we've got to be patient. It might be five years before we've got one established. In the meantime, we can come and cut out small sapling wattles and just nurture the spot. And then when the time is right, we will ring bark this. Now the theory works both ways. Across the other side of the river here, in the river channel and across onto the other side, certainly in the shaded area at the bottom of the gully, is an area that may have been, perhaps was, or certainly could be an indigenous forest area because it's warm, it's, it's south facing, it's moist. And across the valley here, we've got a dense stand of entirely alien species. And the concept is to go and do exactly what I've described here in the stand of invasive species, 
gradually ring bark those in, in a scattered pattern and re-establish an indigenous forest without ever having to come in here with the roar of chainsaws and disturbing of the soil. Now we're standing in a, a forest on the Poort stream, I call it the Poort forest, and just around the corner, less than two kilometers from here, was a very comprehensive study, which is where I'm getting all this information. And it was led by Colin Everson from the University of KZN um, and some of his students who did their masters under him. And they have studied this method and actually written up a methodology on how to go about it. And that is just around the corner and that study comes with all the detail you need, including a complete species list. And so we've actually got a blueprint relevant to this very site on how to do this. It's, it's a perla, it's a, it's a job that is begging to be done. We've got all the science behind us, it's sitting in a drawer, no one's used it yet. It was done in 2014, 2015, thereabouts, so it's relatively fresh. And here is an opportunity to actually put that science to, to good use and monitor our progress. And we're standing right in the spot where that can start happening immediately. There's nothing holding us back. We can start buying a couple of species off the species list. We can plant them or we can just come and identify that we've got one and we can start ring barking. And ring barking is a very low expense activity. It's a lot cheaper than felling trees and cutting them up and stacking them. So there it is, there's an opportunity to swell this forest, to preserve that that's already there and to perhaps swell it into areas where it may or may not have existed as a means of getting rid of a dense stand of alien trees. So the thing to bear in mind is that an indigenous forest like this doesn't belong everywhere. We can't go populating forest like this uh, across the entire terrain. It's quite well established uh, science as to where these forests occur. They occur on the south and southeast facing slopes um, where there's natural draft or moisture that precludes fire and that's where forest belongs. So as a method for removing alien species it has its limitations. I'm looking through the canopy here onto a north facing slope which is purely grassland and of course if we restore that we need to stay true to the ecology and it needs to be grassland. So the technique I've described is, is a bit limited. You can expand it into gullies and on southeast slopes and a little bit up the north slope in the shade zone if you're in a steep gully and then you owe it to the area to be putting grassland above that. So in this case we've got a strip all the way down this port stream which I've made it, measured at around six hectares where we could, we could push the margins of that forest. Above that we'll need to be doing grassland restoration.